Thank you for coming to talk to me, Griff. Perhaps you could start by telling me how you got involved with Dylan Thomas. Um, well, this year I am I'm, I'm sort of involved in, in the centenary year. My engagement with Dylan Thomas probably started like everybody else's, where I was at school, and I think we went to see Under Milk Wood. Now, to say when and how is almost impossible. Well, funny enough, I've, I've been writing a, an article for the Mail on Sunday, which I haven't <laughs> finished yet. I said one version, I think they didn't want it, it's always a complicated business. But the journalist who's working with me said that the first time he felt, the editor, felt that the theatre had ever worked for him was when he watched Under Milk Wood. And it's a very potent spell that it puts over an audience under Millwood. The storytelling in it is brilliant. And the sense of uh, taking you into the language, because it's a play for voices, and yet it does work as a concert performance piece. Almost one which we know doesn't require a lot of extra. Made. I haven't seen Owens, because I know Owen Teal very well, and they're doing a production at the moment. I haven't seen that. But I have seen a couple of productions since then. And it's funny, because of the quality of the writing, it's something that, in order to work, in my opinion, it doesn't need a huge amount of staging. It doesn't help it. Uh, uh, in a funny sort of way, you need to subsume yourself in the voice, but you also need the atmosphere of the stage presence. Now, as I got closer to Dylan, I realised that that was so much part of his writing process, beliefs, that he clearly wrote to be spoken. And the sense of the bardic quality of what he writes is essential. I'm not sure that that, and there's a big argument whether that derives from the sort of Welsh tradition or the English tradition. I think there's a lot of the influence that we know of his father in that, who is a, uh, a teacher of poetry. And so it's interesting that he should have studied via his father or his father's influence the sense of the sense of poetry, the power of poetry, because I'm very conscious that when one gets to an academic level of poetry, in the 20th century in particular, that some of the 19th century qualities of poetry, especially in the mid-century, were uh, slightly being overturned, turned to one side of the, um, uh, the lyrical nature of poetry, the incantatory nature of poetry, was being dropped in favour of um, a, uh, an introspective and metaphysical um, uh, and intellectual nature of poetry. Um, and of course, with any academic, scholastic, um, uh, in cerebral uh, uh, approach to poetry, then of course other things become important. Philip Larkin's quite interesting on that when he, uh, he talks about Marvel's imagery in um, the, the garden and how it's been uh, held up by various critics to be this particular to be this extraordinary imagery, but he says that maybe um, uh, a green thought uh, is actually quite a simple uh, idea to Marvell, and, uh, uh, and not as complicated as Eliot found it to be. <laughs> and for that reason, um, one of the things that we found as we moved back through the 20th century, and today, very very consciously, and particularly in America, uh, with the beat poets, uh, and the Liverpool poets, and the pop poets, well, that was the incantatory nature of poetry returned. And I, this is a very long way of, st of stop me if I'm going on too long, <laughs> but I, I had to do a reading for a charity, for I think it was a cancer charity, and Geraldine James asked me to read. Do not go gentle with that. And I, appro I remember approaching the poem, thinking, oh, I know this poem, oh, I've seen it before. But then I had to read it aloud. 
And reading it aloud, I realised that, like a piece of Shakespeare, the poem, which uh, is simple, in, in some, some ways, is quite brilliantly constructed as an undersprung piece of rhythmic reading. But you actually you start off and go, do not, do not go, do, do, until you get the rhythm, until you get the under, until you read it aloud, and get the underspring, you don't understand how the poem works. And that's what's um, so brilliant about his poetry and, uh, and, and his contribution to this poetic art, which is this belief in the which all great poets and great do have, is the power of the poetic form and the meter to support an argument. Without the argument, the poet is nothing. The poem is, you know, without a, without a new thought to tell us. Uh, and that's very, very important. And that new thoughts are very important, but also that whether it's Shakespeare or, uh, uh, or Tennyson or uh, uh, Larkin, the, the, the newness of the thought, the observation that, uh, that we are engaged in something which we haven't necessarily considered before, even if it's Kipling with if, you know, you, you are taking a point about going, yes, that's a, that's a strong point, but it's the way that the poetry itself, meter, assonant, rhythm, um, uh, structure, uh, how even the absence of structure help you to understand the argument. That those things are the essential. That poetry is not just, unfortunately, prose put out in lines. It's interesting you talk about Tinder of Gentle. Mm. Uh, I spoke to Benjamin Zephaniah mm. a while back, and he thought of Dylan as one of the dead white poets. Right. And uh, somebody said, read Do Not Go Gentle. He said, oh, no, 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 he's one of the dead white poets. So he read Do Not Go Gentle, and he was totally bowled over. And he said, he's no longer one of the dead white poets. Um, there, so and death shall have no dominion as well. It's another, they are uh, strongly uh, poetical poems. They're strongly, and they benefit. And that's the great thing about Under Milk. The other thing that's very, very important about Under Milk, to me, uh, and one of the reasons it will always survive, is it's about poetry in ordinary people's lives. And one of the reasons why I think at one point he was associated with the surrealists and then decided he didn't want to be associated with the surrealists. But he was about the poetic imagination, writing about the poetic imagination that exists in ordinary people. And so um, the dreams of the people who sleep the night through in Under Milkwood are full of poetic imaginings and uh, poetic fantasies that we all recognise. And he's almost saying through this piece, ordinary people have poetry in them. It's not a specialised thing. It's not a thing which is um, unique to the academies or that you have to be as was a very, to be honest, very strong in the, with the Sitwells and the, and the Twenties, this idea that somehow poetry was for a refined intellectual kind of person who was educated to understand poetry and that the great mass, because they so desperately wanted to separate themselves from popular culture, um, that, that, that Dylan said, no, 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 poetry, he's saying all the way through this, poetry and, uh, and the joy of sound and, and, uh, and lyricism and, uh, and words and fantasy, they, they are for everybody. And they are capable of coming from anybody. And that's an extremely important uh, part of the continuing success of that story. Now, we could say, in a funny way, that's quite a Welsh thing. That is quite a, a Welsh belief. And I remember here in Swansea when we were uh, preparing for Mine on Mine and I, I walked up onto the uplands to just stand up there and look out over a section where I was going to do a speech with the band. 
uh, later. I say rather badly because my accent wandered all over and it was, it was a huge long speech and very difficult to learn and the director then said and I want it done very quickly and, and, uh, I, and it took me by surprise and I wasn't quite ready for it. But anyway, um, but while I was researching, um, uh, a guy came and stood next to me and he was a photographer and he came out there to take photographs at various stages out from the council estate uh, to take photographs at various stages and his descriptions and, and ideas that he had about the, the view and the way, the way the weather played across the bay in front of him were extraordinary. I mean they were they were Welsh, if you like. <laughs> they were extremely florid and, uh, uh, and uh, rather beautiful and, and, and poetic, poetically, poetically expressed. And I remember it being, uh, I remember it being quite a, a revelation. And is it also that Under Blookwood is a timeless piece that um, he doesn't introduce cars, planes, mobile phones, or whatever would have been around in the day. I no, I, I, I absolutely see that. And the other thing that's really interesting to me is that there is a duality in it. Because the point about... I remember Malcolm Muggeridge, I, when I went on YouTube to hear various people reading the Duke Malcolm Muggeridge said, oh, and here is a famous elegy by a Welsh poet. And I thought, no, no, you've got it wrong, you see. It's not an elegy. An elegy is a poem of valediction or warning. There are lots of them, and there are some very famous ones. This is a poem about life. It's actually about. Um, it's not about. It's about. It's not about. You know, we we should now rest, lay this soul to rest. It's not about rest. It's not about ending. It's about struggling to live. It's about the fact that we all hang on to life uh, uh, with every uh, uh, breath that we have. We fight for life. And life is about that assertion. And that it's, however, you know, however we go, to, because the good night is ironic. And it's essentially ironic and strangely a, a piece of um, reference which is interesting because it's uh, antithetical to what it says, uh, in as much as the good knight is, is polite and rather sort of, and, and plucked, as it were, as a phrase which resonates in us. Good night, you know, go to bed, sleep, you know, hope the bugs don't bite. It has that slight, that slight parodic element in it. Um, but that's not what the poem's about. The poem is about the good night. It's about the good night is not meant to be something that we want to embrace. The good night is, is the horror of being... It's not a good night. It's, it's a finish. It's, it's, it's a, a, a life poem. It's about life. And that seems to me, and that's one of the reasons when I came to executive produce this story of Dolomite, I was interested to read the biographies because the potency of his work and the power that he could give to his work and the finicutiness that he brought to his work um, there's uh, the sense that you know he needed the words to be absolutely as he wanted them is familiar for, for me for a lot of obsessed writers that I've known but also, the inland sailor, the, the distractiveness, <laughs> if you like, of the pub and company and noise and, and conversation, that's also something that I have known amongst the people. And that, that duality, but that's about life, you see. That's about the... That's about the struggle between living life as an experience and writing about life, which are two 
separate uh, uh, strands that come together in that poem and other poems. I think um, in, in the film, um, one of the most powerful parts of the film are, are the Dylan poems as, as they are as they are read by Tom Hollander. Um, there are two reasons for that thing. There are two reasons why the, the poems are so strong. One is Andrew's writing, because he recognises, and that's what, in a funny way, uh, I hope this is recognised. Because I think Hannah uh, was worried that, that any film about him would not focus on the poems. What she wants is the creative the genius of Dylan to come through. And I think they do come through extremely strongly in this book for two reasons. One, because Tom reads them very beautiful, very moving. Uh, the, they are a sudden stilling of the active, but that's part of Andrew's uh, creative um, ability, which is very, very beautifully done in the film, is that he arrives in a maelstrom into this world, this uh, overpowering world of New York, uh, and out of this badinage, this dis, dis comedy wit, this um, drinking, puking, demi that he's in, they shine. They, they suddenly break through. And that's exactly, you know, if, if we tried to, if you tried to write this, as many poems, films about poems, poets that I have seen, by saying, look, here he is in the circumstances. <laughs> One of the great lines is where the captain lies, it's the transformative power of his bloody genius, she says, when they're standing on Fern Hill. The transformative power of his genius is comes through in these poems. They suddenly take us out of this world that we're in, like a complete change in gear, like a change to the poetry. And that's what makes them suddenly you go, wow. They, they make you sit back. And that, that, that is uh, wonderful because it is in the middle of all this chaos that they happen. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think Actually, that makes you think about the poems as they do that and the strength that they have. Yes, I think, I think they, they're almost in isolation. As you wrote, the well, they're, the they're like a huge contrast. Yes. They're like being in the middle of a stormy sea yes. and suddenly being lifted up out of it. And, that, that is, uh, and that's one of the things that Andrew was terribly keen to do. And, you know, I absolutely bow down to it because I'm the person you know, who was presented with this script and asked to comment, you see. So, as somebody presented with the script and asked to comment, you go, well, what am I going to say? You know, you ask yourself, is this going to be, be too much poetry here? Too long? Should we be cutting away a lot earlier and getting back to the, the action and the other thing that goes on? But actually, <laughs> uh, Andrew had judged it extremely well. And... Uh, and knew that it needed the full length and all that time, and that's, all those things would work for it. Okay. How did the film project come about? Was that something that you started, or was it something that came from somebody else? Uh, it entirely started with me uh, and Sarah. I'm afraid it started in a very crude way. Uh, she, we're talking, I've got a meeting coming up at BBC, and to try and sell them stuff to keep my company going. We are a, we're a sort of one-off company. We, we've made a lot, but we don't make returning series. We make one-offs, what kind of things about Kipley and Wolverine Owen and some, all of which have been quite successful. And then we occasionally make series with me charging on that. So I was going to see Mark Bell and I said, you know, I'd, Sarah had said, well, there is an anniversary of General Thomas coming out. Maybe we should try and, and make a, a programme about so we did a lot of reading and uh, I went in in order to make a documentary to begin with and, uh, and Mark said well uh, you know this feels like a, uh, so it a like drama a well it didn't start life it was a discussion with him and Adam Barker who's now the interim um, head of BBC2 and, and Adam had some thoughts for people that we should talk to Ruth Caleb 
And so, with this idea of this area, this sort of, this chaotic end of his life in mind, we went off and started from there. Well, it's a, a very exciting project. And you're also involved in Fitzrovia. Yes. Is, is that something that came out of your uh, involvement with the film, or was that something that was... I've got myself into a little bit of trouble and a bit of a pickle in Fitzroy. I've always worked in Fitzroy. Uh, I started life working for the BBC after I left university in the drab office, which is just around the corner from where I live now, in uh, uh, at the top of Great Portland Street. And it was an area which was intriguing. And then I, we lived in, we worked in Percy Street, obviously in Percy Street, Newman Street. So we, we, a, a talk back in its heyday had big, had big buildings in uh, all across uh, uh, Victoria. And uh, and then when I, I came to live there as a resident, I, I love it. I never loved living in an area of London better. It was the mix of, of creative studios and things that still... It's still a very potent sort of little village area, which for some reason, which is completely... Uh, has, has avoided um, excessive development. It, it was always a forgotten square of London, behind Oxford Street and coming down from the Euston Road. And it's, so it's full of... People of interesting, intriguing things, intriguing pubs. Well, it is quite remarkable, isn't it, that you've got Oxford Street, which is busy, busy. Yes, busy. Tottenham Court Road, which is busy, busy, and in the middle. And you, this you area, which is full of people living there. University yeah. students, yeah. full of uh, lots of people living there, little, little studios, uh, sculpture supply shops, flute supply shops, all sorts of extraordinary bits and pieces of old London, and things that moved there and Covent Garden got to the place. So I became, I've become heavily involved in with others in a love of Fitzrovia and an attempt to just control the change that inevitably happens. Because there was a sort of flight from inner cities like that because of pollution. And then when pollution um, has cleared up, my generation wanted to move back. We saw no reason for not living in the middle of towns. And so into the middle of towns we went and started re re-inhabiting them. Um, and I'm concerned that there's quite a pressure to... Well, this is why I say I got myself into trouble, because I just wanted to alert people to the fact that there's a very big mix, a very good social mix in Fitzgerald. It's not a, it's not a uh, rich man's uh, ghetto, nor is it uh, 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 deprived in a city. It's a mix, and it's a village, and it needs to be aware of its antecedents. And so part of me organising a Dylan Thomas Festival is to say, I don't think there's another part of London Possibly Chelsea, Reach, but uh, just that sort of, you know, that little bit down there. But there's no other part of London which has this extraordinary artistic um, history. Every painter of note, from Constable to uh, Bacon, has stalked those streets. They, uh, every writer of note has, at one point, George Orwell, they've all hung out in those pubs. And, and uh, Daniel Defoe is the first person who notes it is, it is the building off that Fitzroy, Karl Marx got himself into a fight on Tottenham Court Road when he went down to intervene uh, in, a, in a fight that was developing and then the whole lot, lot of them turned on him because they thought what's this German doing coming into a fight and when you put all these things together and think of that area it's impossible to walk through it and yet somewhere there are people who are planning to sanitise it and, and try and make it a bit more sort of you know commercially acceptable. So I don't mind. I'm very much in favour of businesses and I'm really happy that they should be putting money into doing what they can, but I don't want to lose the character of it in the place. I, I think what's, what's extraordinary is that the pubs are as they would have been probably a hundred years ago. Yes. They, they, and, and that's very unusual to find well, a, for me, a number of pubs that, are, that have, never, have not been modernised. Yeah. Well, what's important so here we are in the middle of Swansea, and we're in a shopping area. We're in an area which has been designated by a zoning committee in the 1970s, 
being an area where there should be commerciality and shopping, and that's all there is. Um, in, there we are in the heart of London, as you say, just off Oxford Street, and it's full of people living there. Absolutely thick with people living there, just as they always have done. And that's what I love about it. That seems to me is the future. That's the greenest future for us all. That's the greenest, safest future for cities. Is not to have areas which are, are are only used for half the day and then deserted at night, yeah. you know, and yeah. filled with people sort of hurrying through them to avoid being trapped by some guys who are out looking for a fight. You know, it, you've got to have a pla- You've got to have, as we have, in a complete mix of people living there, working there, in small offices, big offices. Yeah. Not, 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 not. Let it, you know, not get so worried because councils have a, have an attitude which is that they will make more money out of rates if they can improve the business area, and they want the all. And then that by doing so, they actually consciously or unconsciously destroy what is actually what actually makes the place thrive and work. And that seems to be the error that we Britain have made with too many towns. Yeah, I think I would agree with you on that. Um, and the Dylan Thomas Festival that you've got running this year, is this, is this the first year that it's run? Uh, well, I don't know whether it will be the only year. What I wanted to do, and this is because I've been involved a lot in neighbourhood forums and people who care about Fitzrovia, uh, I wanted to uh, assert, I wanted to give Fitzrovia an artistic, you know, uh, voice for, to, to just, and to, to assert its heritage and history, artistic history. So that's, that's one, one of the reasons, the principal reason that I'm doing it, why I've got in touch with the na- neighbourhood forum and uh, the partnership and uh, so on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> So I've, I've tried to see this as bringing together as many people, including all the small business and independent businesses in the region, um, to say, let's all get together and... Because and, sometimes it can be very quiet at the weekend. Blissfully quiet. I mean, if you live there, so you want a noisy place, go out to the suburbs. If you want a quiet place, sometimes I look out of my window, some two people cross the square the entire day <laughs> on a Sunday. <laughs> it's astonishing, um, and uh, uh, that's we are just off the Euston Road. Where it's, it's marvellous. Um, I know that when I first moved there, it was, it was a slightly frightening place because um, you thought, "What am I doing, moving in with children into the middle of this, this right into the middle of this sordid city of ours?" And uh, Ian McEwan wrote a novel about it. He moved into the same square and wrote Saturday, based around that. And uh, extraordinary. And uh, you go, uh, but it's not true, Ian. <laughs> he wrote uh, a novel which sort of featured the sort of sense of paranoia, taken to its natural conclusion with, with robbers, murderers running around and breaking into your house and all that nice stuff. I, I have to say, we all thought that when we first moved there. But in fact, it's, it's the quietest, least, you know. There was a little bit of running about during the riots, you know, when the riots happened. But it was, I mean, the riots happened in Camden, the riots and, and you get robbed for your Rolex watch in, uh, in Chelsea because there you're living in a rich ghetto, you know. And in a funny way, the mix, the social mix that we had, meant that everybody's, and that's what I just desperately want to keep. To keep that mix, I don't think it should go either one way or the other. Really, I may be an old romantic. Well, I wish you luck with that, thank you. and uh, thank you very much for talking to me today. Pleasure. And, uh, and I wish you luck with the film. Which I well, it'll be interesting. It's going out in about a month, so we, everybody, a lot of people who've seen it, uh, have been moved by it. And I think that's the main, the main thing. I, I think it um, it shows Dylan in a very sympathetic way. It, um, uh, it, 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 the, 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 the danger would be that it reinforces him being a womanizer and a drunkard. Well, I guess I don't think it it's does true. I, think it um, I know that I'm talking. I, I know, having spent uh, a lot of my early youth uh, charging around uh, the f- flesh pots of Soho. Uh, although people wouldn't think of me as people like that. I don't think the flesh was, but you know, the bars and dives of Soho and 
Fitzrovia. I think it's interesting that uh, I found all that rather exciting, you see. Uh, but Hilly Jane said to me, she's just written a book, she said, uh, you, you know, Griff, the trouble is that there's still a great movement in the world where people say, oh, that old drunk, you know, about, about <laughs> that young drunk or whatever, <laughs> that drunk Welshman. And the truth is that um, I hope, uh, as you say, there's more to this, this story. Well, I think if he was a drunk, he was the most famous drunk to come out of Swansea. Um, and there's been an awful lot of them to come out of Swansea. Thanks very much.